so it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Professor Joseph Sack. Um, he's an IT distinguished professor of computer science in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering in the University of Minnesota. He's a fellow of SIAM and the American Association for the Advance of Science. Uh, and most famously, he is known for being the creator of GMRS, which was known, which is known as one of the top ten algorithms of the 20th century. Um, so everyone in town knows about it. Because of the class. <laughs> um, so the, he is our student invited speaker, and the way we do this is everyone in town nominates someone or well, multiple people, and then we vote and decide who's going to come. Uh, so last year, Mark nominated him, and unfortunately, Mark is no longer with us. Hey, Mark. Uh, he's in Seattle. Um, so I think uh, the best, I could talk on and on about Joseph's achievements, but the best way to finish this introduction is to just mention what Mark wrote when he made the nomination, which is, Professor Sad works on sparse matrix completion, parallel algorithms, and eigenvalue problems, and he has made significant advances in all those fields. He has published hundreds of high-impact papers in numerical analysis, and is someone you will learn to hate slash admire if you work in this field, <laughs> as he has had every idea you can ever come up with. Last time, uh, I couldn't make it, because uh, lots of snow. Yesterday, I almost didn't make it. <laughs> Someone <laughs> maybe have to need to come here. I almost missed my connection. So, very good, again, it's a very uh, nice place to be, uh, to be here, and I had my first visit here. Uh, thank you all for coming. So, I'm going to be talking about uh, eigenvalue problems, and uh, specifically filtering techniques. Uh, as way of introduction, uh, this is just uh, introductory material. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I guess, a broad colloquium, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, background material. So, the origins of eigenvalue problems are many. You have uh, initially, a lot of problems came from structural engineering, uh, and then the biggest users actually of uh, a large scale uh, algebraic problems are in physics, uh, whether it's in the structure, uh, electronic structure, or chemistry. The biggest users actually are in chemistry. The biggest users of, of supercomputer uh, time are in quantum chemistry, and there are many problems with algebraic problems. They have also problems with uh, tricks, stability analysis, of electric networks, whatever. So this is very common. Uh, you also have now uh, different types of applications that come from data. Uh, they're slightly different from those with the traditional uh, mentioned. Uh, the, the types of problems are linked to SVD, singular value decomposition. You often have to compute subspaces, uh, you know, corresponding to the largest uh, or, uh, eigenvectors or the smallest ones if you look at the graph of uh, There are many problems approximating uh, 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 matrix or tensor. Uh, but the methods are really uh, dominated by SVD by calculations, and those are related to algebraic problems. So, what kind of uh, problems do you see? This is a standard algebraic problem. Uh, so, Ax equals 1 by x. A could be symmetric or uh, emission complex, or it could be non symmetric. You have very often in uh, finite elements or uh, other types of problems, uh, uh, generalized problems. So, B is, is a matrix that typically positive definite and well, very well conditioned. Uh, very high point for it's almost it's almost like the identity matrix plus some some additional term. So it, it's not easy, it's not very hard to endure. The next difficulty comes when you look at uh, quadratic problems. And uh, these are arising mechanical systems, very common. Uh, and uh, they often you convert this into a simple uh, it's easy to analyze this to make it into a linear, linear problem which is half twice the size. But now we're seeing more problems that are nonlinear. It becomes because very often this problem actually comes from the simplification of a problem like this. They have more terms in here. And people just take the, the simplest approximation to these terms and it's just a variety term. This is what you see now. So there are 
we're actually getting uh, into this area just right now. We have, a, uh, we have a couple of projects in this. So this is general form of nonlinear eigenvalue problem. The A of lambda is not necessarily of the form we just mentioned. It could be more complicated. And then it, there is what I call nonlinear eigenvector problems because the, the matrix here it depends on lambda, um, the eigenvalue lambda. Whereas in some applications, the matrix itself depends on the eigenvector, so it's a function of the eigenvector. For example, in electronic structure calculation, if you have something like this, where this is just a, a term that's like a Laplacian, and then you have something here that depends on the lowest k uh, eigenfunctions. So the potential that depends on those. And very often, you, the number of eigenvectors we have here are quite large, right? So uh, this is the types of things here. You, you need to compute often. You just need uh, the smallest ones and the largest ones. This is very common. You also uh, you could have to compute eigenvalues in a given interval. And that happens when you look at, uh, for example, the vibration analysis, because you want, you want to avoid some frequencies. That happens when you look at, for example, when you build a, a tower, you want to avoid some frequencies, because you know the frequencies that, could, uh, that arise in that area when there is an earthquake, and you want to avoid those. Very common problem uh, in uh, structures. So, in some applications, uh, you need really a large number of, of eigenvectors. And uh, I'm, uh, I've been doing some work in addition to functional theory for a while now. Uh, I'm not doing it anymore, but I uh, uh, was involved in this for about a couple of decades. Uh, so, you're looking at the lowest eigen modes of a uh, matrix of the form I just showed you. And uh, these are called the ground states. So the state, the, the system without any uh, uh, energy or something. But then you have these excited states, which are even more complicated, where you have transitions between states. And that involves uh, even more eigenvectors, because you, what they do typically is they compute all the, uh, the ground states plus additional ones to affect uh, uh, transitions. And that gives really a lot, uh, quite a few eigenvectors to compute. So to give you an idea, imagine the matrix has 10 million by 10 million, which is not large for this application. And you want to compute like the 100,000 eigenvectors. That's the goal, right? So we have had actually an example like this already about 15 years ago, where we had a matrix of size maybe uh, 8 million, and we wanted 20,000 lowest eigenvectors. Fortunately, there is uh, there something that helps you, and that's the symmetry of the system. So you can, in that particular case, there's a fourfold symmetry, so which means you can solve and reduce the size of the matrix by, by a factor of four uh, by taking you know, by uh, taking advantage of the symmetry. So but anyway, that, these are the kinds of things you see in these applications. More recently, we've been working with some people from Rice University on uh, computing the, uh, the uh, Earth moment modes. Uh, so this is actually not another very complex application. I'm going to take, talk some more about it at the end. Okay. So there's a fine element model, and uh, we're trying to show how the session with Earth, all the different different types of uh, all of these are different uh, like uh, pieces, slices, and we have different types of uh, materials. So you have to have different types of discomposition. It's, it's very complex. So now. Uh, having uh, talked about the problems, the next thing is to tell you about the tools that are used in this area. So what are the tools? Uh, the basic one is uh, projection process. So you want to extract eigenvectors from a substrate. Okay, so you're, you're saying the or whatever, the initial thing is why eigenvectors that come from the substrate because we know there's a, that gives, uh, gives you a good approximation. You can find a good approximation from that subspace to your eigenvectors. So you do a projection process with this, which means you, 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 you write this linear or convergent condition that says, I'm looking for a lambda, which is a complex number, and a u delta, which is, belongs to k, such that this residual is a final to k. Or sometimes you can have actually a different subspace here. Now this k is of dimension m, m is small, so it gives you an eigenvalue problem, which is an m by m uh, problem, and you can solve that. That's actually what you see here. So lambda is called the next value, and vy, which is the approximate eigenvector, 
this color is black. So this is very basic. It's used everywhere. Okay. Uh, so for example, there's two common subspaces here. One is the power subspace, which uh, is which is a subspace equation. So you take the subspace k zero x zero, sorry, and you take a to the power k uh, x zero, and that gives you a subspace. Of course, you can see that there are some possible difficulties with numerical stability because you take the power k. But you need to have to worry about uh, you know, both, essentially uh, paying attention to that. that K you can take, you can take different polynomials instead of the power polynomial, you can take trivial chart. So these are all different uh, different kind of uh, variations to this, but basic idea is you use the kind of Now then you have tribal subspaces, uh, which are like this. So you take it's just essentially polynomial subspaces, so a polynomial of A, a polynomial of A times B, so those are the vectors of that form. And these are very powerful. It's really uh, a very basic way of representing. Uh, the, if you take the representation of the matrix in the substance, you get a very good idea of the of the, of the matrix, the property. So that's uh, you can see this uh, as a tool in a lot of different areas. Way of projecting. So the uh, continuing with the tools, you have a shift and linear. Uh, which is another uh, trick that's used in a lot of codes, for example, uh, in things like AR back or whatever. So what you do is you, you have a, if you, you, if you look at eigenvalues near sigma, sigma is some number, okay. then you replace A by, this, by A minus sigma equals. The reason being that we know that these methods that I just talked about, the power uh, or the travel subspace or the power subspace, those will give you better approximations if you, uh, because the eigenvalues here are much better separated. If you take uh, the, 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 the uh, convergence would depend on the separation of the eigenvalues. And these would tend to be extremely well separated in their, in their sigma, because there is a, a pole in there. So they would be extremely well separated. So the convergence, convergence would be extremely fast. Of course, the drawback is you have to invert the system, you have to solve the system. Uh, so that still used a lot, and in fact, if you, for those of you who are familiar with Nastran, which is a code used in uh, uh, structural engineering, which is very, very old code, I'm not sure it's, I think it's probably still called Nastran, and they, this is, the basic idea is just to use this with functions. And uh, I remember when I was in the, as a postdoc in the early 80s in Berkeley, uh, there was a lot of work on this stuff to try to uh, essentially Put the long shots, the block long shots, I were to work. Those days were the early days of long shots, you know, as a reliable long shots. So they're putting that, uh, uh, those things into mass plan and then trying to make it work. It's really interesting. Uh, and it's still, uh, still actually used that way. Now there, is a, there has been a recent uh, contender to this, uh, which is a method based on some sort of fundamental composition called PMLS. And uh, there is some, I'm not sure what the situation is with that. AMLS is, is a sort of a composition approach where it's essentially a sort of uh, shift and invert, but using the non decomposition. And, uh, so, and that ha they have shown that you could do much better than this with that code. So that's an interesting thing. So this requires uh, factoring this matrix. And in the case of NASRAM, they would select a, a shift, sigma, and then they would go as far as they can until the convergence gets, gets becomes slow. Actually, they, they use a sigma that's exhausted, and they use another sigma, they factor again, and they continue doing that until they have all the other values. That gives you an idea. That is how they do it. OK. Uh, now, these are the, the other things that are used are deflation factors. Deflation, restarting, they, they go all in different, in different names. Essentially, when you have a computer set of eigenvectors, you just remove them from the system. That means that your, your matrix now has, you can, uh, it's as if the matrix doesn't have those eigenvectors in it anymore. So that means you can then concentrate on the next ones. But that's the idea of deflation. The starting is somewhat similar. It's just really trying to uh, find a way of removing, figuring uh, out the eigenvectors that are And this is, for example, uh, you see in the app back, which is still a code that's uh, uh, kind of set as a, as a standard now still. It uses a modi or long shift on the symmetry plus the symmetry starts, which is some form of restarting. 
flushing the river, that's not that's an option. But so there are all those ingredients I talked about are the foundations of the codes that you see now. So in terms of codes, what is out there? So you have, uh, if you learn to complete either based on one end of the spectrum, you have things like subspecies situation plus different, like represented by fees, check chest type operations, you have long chest plus variance, you have bike premier, you have uh, tracing, those are block algorithm, block, like block long chest, etc. block PCG. And I have a lot of different variations on these. For interior driving value problems, you can be assigned the spectrum. These are for the end, one end of the spectrum, whether the largest or the smallest. But with interior, uh, very often you will see shift and revert as the main tool, or that rational filtering, as you see in the and I'm going to talk about that in a second. Okay, so for solving interior driving value problems, the difficulty is the solution of the system. So these are the main things that are used for interior driving value problems, again. Okay? Three possible options: you have shift and invert, or non shift and rational filtering. And the difficulty with solve with the shift and invert is you have to factor the matrix, and you have to uh, essentially solve it. And I, I tell you, in that application that I mentioned of, of, of number modes, the biggest difficulty we had was to find a, a good code that uh, that for, for uh, that could implement parallel for factorizing because we wanted direct solver. And you look at mumps, you look at uh, uh, there are a couple of things that are available. <coughs> and uh, it turns out that the difficulty is not in the factorization itself, because they put a lot of effort to get something that's very efficient for the factorization, that it's not pay attention to the back of the forward sum, triangular sums. In our case, we had to solve many, many times the same factorization. So that cost is important. And uh, the, the, uh, essentially, the cost we thought initially there was a, a bug or something, but no, there was just the, the, the fact that it did not perform well for the triangular sums. So, then, so there's, a, there's some difficulties in the, uh, with the dry solvers in the case. So that brings me to uh, filtering. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about polynomial filtering, and uh, this is the main thing that I want to discuss. Uh, is, is one thing that I want to, to, to get from this presentation is just to understand you know, how polynomial filtering is used. And also, it's not only used for any better problems, but you can find users in other areas. And there's quite a few of these uh, things that are useful in uh, like evaluating functions of matrices and all of these. So, uh, the, we want to compute the eigenvalues of the matrix by slices, by pieces. The term spectrum slicing incidentally has been introduced by uh, Beresford Fraulet. Uh, in those days, I've talked about exactly the so slicing the spectrum and computing each slice independently. Uh, so the idea is to apply a function or some situation to solve this problem. So I have a phi is a polynomial or a rational function. I'm going to try to solve this. Okay. And then here is a presentation, a presentation of the function. So you have one something that's large, where you want the eigenvalues to be a small interval here. So you want the function phi to be large in that interval, to be smaller. Okay? So you want to compute the slices separately. And the main point here is that the slices are to be computed independently. And the reason why you can do that is that the, the, you, can, you don't have to zero analyze between these two slices. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. So here's the main, the main uh, loop will be like this for each slice. Get all the eigenvectors in the, in, the, in the slice. That's it. I have to make sure to not miss anything. Um, the very common question that I get asked here is about the authorization. I'm going to talk about that in okay. okay. So the idea is, the rationale is that eigenvectors computed here and those computed here are going to be a five loop. You don't have to worry about the phenomenon. So imagine you have 100,000 eigenvectors to authorize. Okay. That would be, it would be too much. But if you have a few pieces like 1,000 each, there's no, no problem. Just they don't have to be authorized. You can, you can handle that. And so, that actually, so now the, the thing is that uh, you would need to worry about nearby clusters. Because when you have very close eigenvectors, you have to worry a little bit about the phenomenon. 
they would not even pay attention to that because uh, you can do that as a post processing if, if necessary. Because they, they tend to be reasonably, uh, if you have complement at high accuracy, you don't have to worry too much about that. Okay, so if you get an idea of this, what they just said, here's a very simple example. Take uh, 49, uh, 49 to 49 degree Laplacian, find a difference, regular grid, uh, very simple uh, Laplacian, and configure all the eigenvalues in the interval 0, 1. That's the problem. Turns out there are close to 2,000 eigenvalues there. So 1,971 eigenvalues or something. So, and then I'm taking, this is on the scalar machine, it's not, and no parallelism at all here, just one scalar machine. And this is one slice, two slices, two slices, two six slices. And this is the cost. As you see here, you put the cost. And the cost goes down, which is an sequential. And the gain comes from the fact that you have less uh, orthogonalization to do. You don't have to orthogonalize vectors between each other. And you have uh, even the uh, Small problems that you're dealing with, uh, the risk problems are small. So if you take uh, the risk problems, the V transpose A and E, that's small in nature. That actually is not really difficult in this context because it can be uh, a, large, a large problem if you have a uh, have large dimension, large collapse space. So that's interesting. Now, if you take, if you add parallelism to this, then I'm, I think I will show this illustration of the same problem when you add parallelism. So you cut down in the cost even the sequential. We're not in the future. So uh, we, again, we look at trying to uh, find a polynomial of A to use. And we want to have uh, the high part separate from the uh, uh, small part. And this, I remember mentioning that this is an old idea. But use this. Actually, the, using polynomial of test for linear system is quite old. It's uh, you know, 1990 from these uh, papers by. So I have a lot of other people who look at this. For argument problems, I've seen this work also maybe in the 70s, but it was not really, uh, people didn't pay attention because the timing was, was not good. At the time, you had a mixture of uh, uh, approaches and functions which was coming out. And the problems were not that big at the time, so it was not really competitive. Now it's becoming competitive. You have a large number of arguments coming out. Yes, that it So what kind of polynomials would you use? On one end of the spectrum, whether it's larger or smaller, you just check each other. There's no better choice in this case. It's simple. And uh, for each other case, we had a lot of different, went through uh, different phases. Uh, and we decided in the end uh, to go with the Dirac approximation, Dirac function. There are a lot of reasons why we did this. We, initially, we wanted something that has a plateau and they turned it and down. It, was, it turned out not to be essential to have that. It's much better to have something like this, uh, yeah, an approximation of function like this. Because this goes by different names. But it's just simply the, this square of approximation is part of the right function. All right. So uh, for mathematicians, it's not really proper to, because the part of the right function is not a function, it's, it's a distribution. Uh, but physicists do it without paying attention. It's just the squares. And it works fine, no problem. And it's, it's uh, interesting, but it actually does quite well. You know, the uh, approximation itself does quite well. So, the, uh, the here is the extension. It's very you can this, uh, it's, uh, it's just the brilliant to see that this is an extension of the Dirac function, the Dirac function in terms of Chebyshev polynomials. These are the coefficients you need. And if you think of justifying this mathematically, you say, well. There is a, uh, something that has been done in the 90s about the squares polynomials to for for for, for, uh, for actually preconditioning and that comes back here because this call will have a polynomial that minimizes this function r of t for this is a change of weights and the minus one one okay over r polynomials of the predestined of k such that r of gamma is equal to one so now we're taking R of gamma equals to one. And this is not a perfectly stated problem. There's no, there's no different direct function here. And that this function actually is the same as this one, except for scale. So you can justify it this way. And there are a couple of uh, theoretical results you can prove, and that's those. So, but in addition to, to this uh, expansion, what you need is also uh, damping coefficients. This, these are 
which we have here, the density coefficients, because I'm, I'm going to talk about this a bit later, because we have oscillations, and this is introduced. Uh, so that's essentially it. This is the polynomial, and then this is uh, this also the density coefficient like that. So I'm going to give you some details on, it, on this, and uh, how, how this works. So the first thing to do is I'm, what I'm given is an interval. That's all. I'm given an interval. And I want the polynomial that's high in that interval and smaller square. In order to make the code simpler, I would like a situation like this, where I have just a bar here, for example, and everything that's above that bar corresponds to the quantity eigenvalue, and everything below it corresponds to the rest and one power. So if I take gamma, this the gamma is the, the point where the delta function is centered. If I want gamma to be in the middle of the interval, that's just the first thing, the first thing that you think about. That doesn't work. It gives you something like that. So it's very easy to see that. So what we do is we want to move gamma to some place in the, to, so that you have a balanced thing. So that's the first thing to do. And you solve this equation. So psi is uh, on the left side, it on the right side. And you want a gamma. A gamma, gamma is the unknown here. So the difference is zero. You solve that with Newton's, or actually there's, you can express that as an algebraic problem as well, a small algebraic problem. Solve that accurate it has to be very accurate. And then we show the right gamma. So this, the first thing you solve is this one. The next thing is I want to get the polynomial degree and the polynomial itself. So you think, well, let's that, let's get that user, but that, that doesn't work very well because you're, uh, it, you will always uh, you will often fail if you take a low degree. So low degree polynomials uh, will give you uh, will not give you enough difference between the high and the slow uh, eigenvalues, and that means they will not converge. They will converge so slowly they will not converge. A high degree will give you, will waste a lot of uh, time. So you have to have a compromise, and the way we do it is by starting with a low degree and adapting the degree up to a point where you have, uh, you reach a certain value. I'm going to show in this case here. This is just on one side. Look at the, in this case, what you do is you take uh, you take your interval, you take gamma is adapted every time, and you increase the degree until you reach the value here that's like 0 0.8, for example. You fix 0 0.8 because it turns out this is a very good compromise in our experiments. You just you have to have only one value, and that's the value, 0 0.8. So if you want to get plateau here to reach that one point. Here's an example. This is a, an actual example. I forgot what the interval is. It's a very small interval near, near, near one. So this is degree three. And they see there's no solution to the problem because you cannot find an interval. Uh, you cannot find a polynomial that has the same value on both sides. It starts, it doesn't work here either. It starts at seven. So it degree increases. And at seven, you start now having a solution. You can find a polynomial that has the same value on both sides. So degree seven. Uh, but the, the gamma, which is the, the bar, there's a little bar that you can see here, that's too high. And you, you lower it by increasing the degree until you reach 23 and you reach 0 0.8 and you have a satisfying the polynomial. The polynomial is degree, degree 23, and that's what can be, be used. So to give you an idea, this is a, a very simple example. You have a, an, an interval that's uh, not too thin, but in some of the applications we have, the degree could be up to like 5,000. So it's very, it could be very high degree. And that's the best you could use, essentially, because if you take, take it smaller than that, it wouldn't work, uh, it wouldn't work too well. It wouldn't work. So that's a, uh, it has to be adapted. OK, next. This is just a, a, a little bit of a zoom of the polynomial. It's the same polynomial for sure with a zoom theory. OK, so now uh, I will just show you the next uh, Thing we have to deal with, and that's the oscillations. So, because you're essentially dealing with a discontinuous function that you're uh, approximating with the numbers, you have oscillations. It's not, a, uh, it's not, a, you have oscillations, you've got chips oscillations, and uh, people don't like those. It turns out not to be a big problem here, by the way. It's, it's okay. But it's still useful to put some damping on the power to have more than what we have this time. So we could do, this is, the, the thing you see here, the dashed line, is without any damping. Uh, this thing here is called Jackson dumping. Jackson invented this technique 
for equal to zero to the purpose of the proof of theorem. And uh, it's very, I could, as you can see here, absolutely no, no oscillations at all. It's perfectly smooth. But it's too smooth, actually, for our purpose. And we found that the monstrous, the monstrous theorem himself had a, has a, a dumping technique called, we call it the sigma dumping. And we call it the monstrous sigma dumping. And it's actually a nice, it's a very nice compromise between the two. That's actually what you see here. We don't want to be, we don't, we don't want the thing to be completely flat because it, it leads to, it's an overkill essentially if you uh, occur with two uh, So, but this is more pronounced and gives you better convergence. And so, uh, that's the next thing to do. Well, you're, this is something that you can uh, have essentially that the user select with the three. Uh, now, the next thing you do is you're going to, you need to see how to integrate this <coughs> projection technique with this long short subsection integration. So, I'm going to talk uh, quickly about that. Uh, we have, uh, it's just a background on the Montrose algorithm. The Montrose algorithm is essentially an algorithm that does a projection on this subspace, the private subspace. And Montrose really uh, viewed this from, for a non approximation viewpoint. There's a, a nice parallel between this and uh, still just polynomial, which are the, the, uh, the, the polynomials that satisfy the general occurrence uh, for a fogger polynomial. Essentially, you're creating a fragment of polynomials. That's how the, the way probably you viewed it and discovered uh, this algorithm. They had the term occurs. And unfortunately, in exact arithmetic, this works fine, but in inexact arithmetic, you lose all terminology, so you have to re the ones. But that's essentially what it is. Just think of it as a projection method on the subspace. So your projection uh, best, essentially the best hiding method on the subspace. So now you need to add some restarting or deflation or whatever. And these are just the variations. So the nice thing about, about the, uh, the subspace equation, which is uh, not using the kind of subspaces, this one has an advantage when you do the uh, electronic structure because you have a sequence of approximations and you could use this previous subspace as an input to the next one. And that helps a lot in this technique. With long trust, you cannot do that. Uh, so the simplest one is long trust without restarts, and then you have thick restart. You have a lot of different ways of doing restarting. Uh, but I will do mostly a talk and tell you about a technique that doesn't do any restart. That actually turns out to be the best in this context for very long future. So if, if the filter is good enough, then you catch all the algorithms in it. This gives you a, 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 a demonstration of how the code works. Let's suppose you're doing long trust without the restart. It's very simple long trust. Okay? And you apply it to this polynomial, or all phase of polynomial, without orthogonalization. So look at the, uh, the algorithms over here, and these are the, 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 the uh, transformed eigenvalues. And if you look at the line, you know, you get, these, are, these correspond to these here. And these correspond to these, as you see. So you try, you'd like to get these eigenvalues, right, instead of transforming these. So what happens here is, if you use long shots, I'm using long shots with fuller authorization. You don't, you don't play with that. It's very, uh, it's good enough that, you know, you can contribute with long shots. You have to, uh, you have to pay the cost. It's very important to do with fuller authorization. So what you do is, you get that. The ask argument will come out first. Converge. You can see it from looking at the, this uh, ID versus this product matrix, and then you get this one, you get this one, and at some point there are no ID versions that come out. You're, you're, you're essentially, you can, you can, the way we do it is look at what we call the restricted trace. So the sum of the ID values that you come from here that stabilizes. So that tip, then you don't have to go any further. You can cut all the ID values. The chances of missing any are. are so in this case, we, we, we could add a certain stuff to check whether any of these but this is good enough. With further organization, you can catch all the actual values. I'll do you a different way on the uh, code we have. So that's the main idea. And that turns out to be much more efficient than trying to reorganize. We had we had initially we started with a thicker star, but we were, we were happy to do that. But it turns out that this is more efficient, actually. It's probably four or five times faster. 
So now the question is how do you slice your spectrum? This is I, I did I told you how to compute the eigenvalues in one slice. Now how do you compute the slices? Well we use uh density of states and uh essentially spectral densities to do that. So here uh this is something that we, we had a, a paper, some of the paper in this nineteen sixteen, we had a there's another paper which does, tells you how to count eigenvalues in an interval. Uh, there's a paper that surveys all these techniques by a, a group of Germans, uh, KPM, for Kermit Ramonian methods. That's an interesting instance of a tool that comes from physics. Physicists use this a lot to, because the density of states has a, a meaning physically. Uh, and they, they, they're interested in this more sometimes, more than the argument. And so the question is, one thing that I've uh, seen is this misconception that uh, load balance, this helps you load balance the, your code. It's not true because uh, when you slice the spectrum to add more of the same number of eigenvalues, the convergence in one, one particular slice is very different from the difference from another. If you only have maybe, this is supposed to have 100 eigenvalues in each, the convergence in one of them could be much smaller than the other. You might need a much higher degree of demand. First one. So it's, it's you really only uh, help with uh, memory usage. You have to make sure it's not have too many eigenvalues in one of these slices. So you have to be careful in how, how to balance the code. So here's the uh, idea of the spectrum slice. So here you have, this is called density of states. What it tells you is essentially on a given interval, it's like, it's like, it's like uh, you know, it's a tiny interval let's say of width delta, delta lambda, delta t, then the number of eigenvalues there would be just the integral. So it would just be the number, this value here, divided by delta t, that gives you the number of eigenvalues in the integral. So essentially, this is the density of eigenvalues, it's just the density of eigenvalues in the integral. So you integrate that value here, you can think of it as, as density being to 1, and then the, uh, so the integral will be equal to 1 if you multiply by two with all the eigenvalues, if you can. So now the only thing I need is to make sure that the, uh, in each interval I have an equal, just an equal uh, slice. So I, have a, I run the integral from ti to ti plus one of this function to be uh, the same. The whole integral divided by s number of slices. That's very easy to implement actually. And your function is available either as an expression of change of polynomials or essentially with, with the long shots that you can then uh, discretize it. It's very easy to implement this. It's cost a Getting the density of states also is a cost of which is very, very cheap. Good. So now the next thing I'll talk about is rational filters. <laughs> so uh, this is also something we've uh, added to our code. The reason why we did this is because there are situations where non filters don't work. And this situation is reflected by this picture. If you have a stretched code uh, structure like this, we have a lot of uh, arguments that are very highly very sparsely distributed on one hand. Then using the polynomial here would be a disaster. It would be a very, very high degree polynomial to yourself. So this is not very good. It would be very ineffective in this case. So in, what we do in that case is to use uh, rational filters. And the natural idea is to use a Cauchy theorems. There are other ways, and I'll show you an alternative in a second. So people have used in the past what is called Cauchy integral representation of spectral projections. So if you take an interval like this, you take a, a circle or any contour that's around it, then you have a spectral projector, which is the projector associated with the eigenvalues inside, which is represented by this Cauchy integral. Okay. And uh, what you do with that is you do numerical integration. So this is going to be a matrix like this. We don't want that. We're not going to apply this matrix to a vector, to a subspace, to a set of vectors. That's what's used in matrices. So imagine you have a, you have a, let's say, you imagine you know that you have like a uh, hundred eigenvalues inside, for example. Then you take a random subspace, a random set of vectors, 120, just a little more than 100. Okay. And you apply this to that vector, to the set of vectors. <coughs> Okay. And if this is a good approximation, good enough approximation, you get a very good approximation of the subspace that's spanned by these eigenvectors corresponding to this projection of the projector. <coughs> so that's the idea. 
And uh, this is used in the piece. Uh, Sakurai and Sidura uh, had a code, had a method that was developed earlier than, than uh, Polizzi. Uh, but the method was, it was based on Krilov, but it was not really, uh, people didn't pay attention to it for a couple of reasons. One, it was published in an obscure Japanese journal. <coughs> it was not invisible. And the second one, I think, is, is because there, the, the technique was not too well presented. It was, uh, there was some potential for instabilities, and people could just stay away from it. But uh, Polizzi had, had uh, uh, re revived this, this sort of ideas, and it was very successful in a code that's a code called Feast. Uh, code called Feast. And it's essentially some situation applied to us for an approximation of this one very, very simple idea. But, you know, I, I've seen actually this, this sort of techniques years ago, but I, you know, people did not really convince, uh, were not really convincing that this was a good approach. And uh, after this thing came up, it was really uh, showed that, that you could do it, uh, even if you have a very rough approximation, only using only using four or five points on the control uh, for integration gives you a reason of approximation for some reason. It's really interesting. You know, what kind of, uh, how do you, uh, now we, we looked at this uh, problem and said, Ask the question, what do I need from, from uh, uh, rational thinking? The, 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 the approach that, has, that is here is just based on using Cauchy integral thread. But what else would I need if I want to integrate something out? It turns out that you don't need to have the plateau uh, at that interval. So we looked at uh, essentially trying to uh, figure out what, what, what would be a good. Uh, rational filter, and for some situation, it turns out that ma what matters the most is the separation between the agonists beside and outside. For example, if you have a curve like this, that there's a big slope here, then that would do much better, because there's uh, the ratio, the convergence of specific ratio is, is governed by the ratio of the eigenvalue here and here. It's very simple to see that. So you need something that, that uh, has a high slope here, derivative at minus one, or one, which is the symmetry is the highest. So we come up with the uh, approach of trying to find the least squares. Uh, if you point to this, we have a function that's plot over here. If we had a, we can uh, play with the parameter beta and so on. So I'm going to skip this part and give you very few details of it. But essentially, it's, it's a way of getting a least squares approximation of function of what we These are the sigma i's here. Sigma j's are fixed, but it's, but it's uh, they are known as alpha j's. It's an extension. And we, we try to minimize this in dispersion. So that's what I mean. So here's uh, what you see for, on, on the toy problem. For example, this is a, a small grid. Uh, we just use four poles, and you call the algorithms inside. And the standard substitute iteration, we compare substance substitute iteration with a substitute iteration with this course uh, filter. And here's the filter. Here's the filter you get from Cauchy, the one in blue, dash. And this is the filter you get from the least squares by just tuning the, the parameters. And you can see that this would be better than this one. And they use the same number of poles, by the way. It's exactly the same number of poles. You can guess from the separation that this would be better. Indeed, it does better. So that's the this is the illustration of this. There are other advantages. In particular, uh, you can repeat poles. It's very flexible. It, it has a lot of advantages. So you put that in EDSL in our code. So now we I'll talk uh, tell you a little bit about this code EVSL. So uh, this is simply the code that has uh, that does uh, spectrum slicing. It uses polynomial filtering. It also uses rational filtering. So the, the, we have two levels of parallelism in the code. We have the levels that come from the slices, and we also have them in decomposition because we have a matrix itself. Which uh, when we have matrix color products, those are done by, uh, by cutting the, the domain in pieces, and then you have so there's two levels of parallels. These are the people who uh, worked hard behind the code. Uh, so uh, Ruth Bank is uh, at the Ross Livermore, Rose here now is at the Emory. Look, Anderson is a PhD student at Georgia. Thank you. <laughs> uh, exactly. yeah, so this is the version one, I'm going to skip that part. So I'm going to tell you 
what we have now is very one point one. So it takes uh, general maps so you can, you can have a product, a major federal product. Very often in applications, you don't have really a matrix, you have major federal product. This is one of the things that they mentioned with the, the uh, more remote, for example. It's very hard to just have a matrix. You really uh, need to have a major federal product. And that, something you can pass to a function, a function pointer. We have, uh, we solve generalized algebraic problems. This is, uh, and then we have the first one different ways. And then we add, we add a long trust to uh, function spectral slicing. We have the KVM and long trust in there. So if you're interested just in getting uh, spectral slicing or just in getting the, for example, the principle of state, you can get it from this code. So it's already in there. If you're interested just in getting, like, how to implement polynomial filters, it's in there. So you can, it's not meant as just for algebraic problems. Uses for other things as well. So. Uh, and then we have also added spectrum slicing for this. It's not trivial because now you, uh, if spectrum, what makes spectrum uh, density of states easy to compute is the fact that many of other products are inexpensive. But here you have to be perfectly big. So how do you do that? Well, we used the polynomial approximations for the inverse of B because in many cases B is extremely well conditioned. So if you to scale this by t to the power minus a half here and here, to get something that's uh, very nicely, uh, uh, it's very well, it's only, uh, it's very well conditioned, so you don't have a high degree of number to use to approximate the universe. Or b to the minus a half, minus a half. To approximate b to the power minus a half by a number. And it turns out we do not need a very high degree. So anyway, this is just uh, some details. We're, we're actually working now on a uh, parallel version of this, which we're just behind. At least it's used in uh, some codes. So I mentioned earlier that I would go back to this example I had earlier. And if you, uh, this is uh, getting all the arguments in 0, 1 of the Laplacian. If you did IX with the, uh, just on the MATLAB, the smallest algebra, you get the number of time it takes is 50,000, close to 50,000 seconds. And if you take uh, some five slices, it's the same example. I'm going to show you six slices. But here are the number of eigenvalues for each, and this is the time it takes for each slice. Okay, so, and the time for spectrum slicing is, is pretty small. This is a pretty small uh, fraction of the cost. So I'm going back to this problem here. So this is the getting uh, the normal modes, earth normal modes. Some of you may not have known about this, but in the 70s, there was a, a very uh, influential paper by uh, Brought up a plasma uh, that computed the normal modes of the oceans. It was a big thing because uh, it was a big calculation, and they used a long cycle. So that was essentially marketed as a bit of a revival of the long cycle uh, you know, as, as, as a real practical procedure. And we're coming back maybe 50 years later, the long cycle is still there, right? Except for the twist, for uh, another filter. So we're using for another filter in here, and it should be. Uh, so these are, we want all the eigenvalues inside a given interval, that's exactly the same as what you would do with uh, sort of things with, uh, uh, where you have to look at uh, stability or whatever, you look at eigenvalues in a given interval. The problem we had initially was something like this. That's how they studied that. My formula for the, these are, uh, I don't what it was like. So the different pieces of the, of the, the crust. And uh, there's, uh, the ocean is something different than the other chapter as well. It's actually more complicated than that. It turns out it's easier to do simulation on Mars because there's no water. <laughs> <laughs> so that's interesting. So, but they actually have simulations for Mars too. They, they have, uh, uh, this is a very interesting project. So the first thing is we didn't want this. It's a big problem. So it's changed the problem by uh, essentially just substituting <coughs> that part together. You're getting rid of it was the large, the last block, and then you have a problem like this with the, uh, the different matrix here. That was the way we solved it. Uh, so then, once you have this, then essentially the major of the product would be by this, and this is the mass matrix. So this is <coughs> showing only the memory usage. Okay. So here you can see that shift on the invert, when you shift on the invert, is very high. And what you see, the tiny thing here, 
is per number fixed. So this is the uh, peak and this is the, the average between the, the, the different the different runs, different shifts and so on. Now but this is the, the last uh, slide I got from there. They're doing kind of other models actually, much more complicated models. This is the old one. And this is just the uh, uh, what do you call it? The risk scalability to show what happens with these problem increases in size. And the risk scalability is studied in terms of different operations, the matrix of products, the products with the matrix B, the right the mesh matrix, this is the efficiency. It turns out sometimes you get higher efficiency than one, uh, etc. So they have like 120 million. I think they're probably now they're just double the average times that. So they look at different models. And this is a very interesting application. So uh, we're getting now into nonlinear algebraic problems. Before I go there, let me just give you a little uh, demo. Uh, 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 so this is what, what I have here. Is uh, this is actually from EVSL, and this is the, the, the naming is Laplacian. This is uh, polynomial functions, Mori organization. Each of those has a meaning. So this is a code that does uh, that solves a uh, problem of Laplacian, and you give it the size of the Laplacian 30, 49, 31. So it's about 27,000 27, by 27,000 matrix, a small matrix. But you want all the eigenvalues in the interval 0, 0 0.8. Okay? It turns out there are like 300 of these, 300 eigenvalues inside. Uh, and I'm giving it n slices. So bank with the five slices. Okay, so let's run it. And now we spend some time getting the decimal states, getting the, the intervals, and then it runs each of them separately. It goes. It takes a little bit of uh, a few seconds. What before the end? <laughs> okay. So here is here are the this is the slices that we found. And it, it turns out it estimated the number of eigenvalues 293. That's the number of eigenvalues estimated. This is the about the yeah, yeah. So now you confuse them. 58, the, the numbers have to be the same. So this is a, well, the first interval, second interval, third interval, uh, interval. These are the intervals, and these are the number of eigenvalues found. There is more data that's dumped in the different files, I'm not sure. And that's done. So now you confuse all the eigenvalues. Okay. Uh, the total, I think, is, uh, if you look at just the seconds, Comes the results here. So these are all the eigenvalues, and at the end is the statistics that show here it is. Uh, this is the time for major for products, time for math facts, etc. So it's only, you know, uh, it's like uh, eight points of seconds. It's confused the end of eigenvalues. So this is the, the pre uh, without uh, without response. So I was going to show quickly. Yes, but I think I'm going to tell you that now we're looking at the nonlinear algebraic problems of this type, and we're using again the push integral formulation. So this is problems of this type. The push is to be any any arbitrary uh, nonlinear functions using push integrals to approximate those, and you end up with a uh, problem like this, which can you linearize and get a large problem like this. You don't solve this problem, you use the integral to solve the nonlinear algebraic This is uh, really uh, some this now and give interesting. So, conclusion. Uh, so, there is, we have a, a, a code that's available uh, if you want to take a look at. Uh, we want to plan, the plan is to release the uh, final code very soon. We would like to get block versions because they're important to some applications. I don't know how much of this we will do for uh, the Russian online version case. It's going to be much more challenging. I don't know how to do it very non-fitting. So we're going to do a uh, rational filter on this. That's a limitation. So we're going to try to continue this thing with uh, Earth modes. Uh, we mentioned this issue with scalability of uh, parallel direct solves. And it's actually a big thing. We need iterative solvers for the indefinite case. They're not satisfactory. So we're going to I'm going to stop here.
feel like in the early 2000s there was a wave of enthusiasm about Jacoby Davidson and yes. everything in the And, and, and uh, that wave sort of subsided. And, you know, there's a bunch yeah. of, I, have you thought at all about whether Jacoby Davidson can be combined with the rational filter? Yes, yeah, actually, it's a good point. I, I was not mentioned that one in the talk, right? Yes, so. Yes, it's very interesting. It gives you, it's a form of deflation, essentially. The way it's used is a form of deflation, because you have, you have these uh, projections that come on both sides. So, I, from our experience, it does have a little bit, but with something like rational, the, something like the uh, uh, motions without the organization, I think it's very hard. For problems where you have cheap net backpacks, it's very hard to build motions without the organization. That's really clear. So they, they might be useful. Yeah, I'm not sure how much you're getting. Any other questions? Yeah. For when, when you're like finding the poles for your rational polynomial, uh, do you see like that they sketch out some sort of contour? Like, can I still apply? Well, the, well, the poles are the, the, the signals used for rational fit frame. When if you do them, if you use uh, Cauchy integrals, they're just the just integration. Select those uh, the integration scheme. The other one with, with our least squares, that we, we just actually what we want is to use one more. Because we, we want to minimize, we're, I didn't go into the details, but we want to minimize the number of uh, uh, solves. In fact, we want to get the pull that's high because we want to use iterative methods. So the pull has to be far from the imaginary axis, for the real axis. Because if it's high, the solves can become easier. So you want to get pull high and you want to make them more close to as high as possible, so we end up using, in most cases, only one curl. So it's actually one double, that you see one Yeah, so we, we select them in advance. It would be nice, actually, there was a project that we tried to select them, which is what you were mentioning. Uh, you know, was it one of the best uh, uh, poles to use? Right? It, it, it could ask the question. It's a much more, much more harder problem. So I imagine that if you take more slices of the bag of benefits, are just going to be too marginal over time. Uh, if you take more and more slices, yeah, then you, you have fewer eigenvalues in each. Right. Okay. So then, uh, so, uh, actually, interesting because of what's the optimal number of exactly. slices? Exactly. That's my question. What's the number of optimal number of eigenvalues in each? So you're running into a difficulty in, in terms of. Uh, Probably get, get marginal gain. Also, you have to be careful about our thrown out here. Where, you know, if, let's suppose I only use two slices. I only have to worry about the formality between very nearby points. That's all. But if you have too many, then you can actually get something uh, which is not as, 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 as nice in terms of the right. So that's, that's a good question. I, I, I eventually, you lose out your system. Thank you again.